I am Lisa, get excited, Taylor, and I, I am an author. And my heart and my passion and my movement is to help women and teenage girls discover the energy in them. Because I find that so many women, we wear masks, um, and we wear so many different hats. And we do forget about ourselves, and we are last. So we take care of everything, we take care of our husbands, get excited, um, <laughs> and our children, but we are always the last on the list. And we forget about our hopes and our dreams and our goals. So it is my mission, my heart, my passion, my movement is to get us women to dream it again, to live it again, to become the all that God created to, to, to be. So that's where my heart and my passion came from. Because I want every woman to know that she is a queen. And I want her to daily wear her crown, whether she has one or not. And then she also, she can go to uh, the dollar store and get one. Because I can get it up, right? Get excited. But I want her to know when she get up in the morning and put on her crown. Um, because she is valuable. And she has something to say. She has to give to, give to the world. So, um. That's why I wrote this book, and that's my heart, my passion, and my moves. And everybody, when you hear me say get excited, you all have to respond back and say, I am excited. So can we just try real quickly? All right? Get excited. I am excited. All right? Wes, can you share with Wes Alvin, State's Attorney. Uh, I have been a prosecutor now for almost about 20 years. Ended up becoming a lawyer. I actually know how I got there. I got into a little bit of trouble in school and found my way through the school judicial system and decided that uh, representing folks was kind of a way to go. And then uh, when I, in my third year of law school, I actually had the opportunity to be a, a student boy in a, in a district court. And I handled a case that involved a young man bringing a uh, handgun on the school So I prepared this case. And stood up in front of a judge and in law school they teach you to speak slowly and hold on to your hands and not get too excited. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and so I had this opportunity to explain to a judge you know, why this young man should be held accountable for what he did. And I stood up and I started to speak and I had about five minutes of prepared what they call allocution or, or reasons. Sort of the New York and the Italian came out of me in the first 30 seconds, and I spit out five minutes of speech in about 33 seconds. My hands were swinging like a window, and I went to sit down. And, you know, I don't know. I played a lot of college football, baseball. I played some minor league baseball, so I've been in what most people would consider a pressure situation. And I get about three quarters of the way back down into my seat, and my knees get up, my behind hits the seat. And I looked over at my mentor, and I kind of knew this was my calling. I said, "I this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life." Um, as I've gone through it, I get to work with people in the very worst portion of their life. Um, victims of crimes, uh, and even defendants. Uh, the unique thing about prosecutors is we actually serve both sides. And unlike lawyers in any other profession, prosecutors are advocates for victims, but we also have to demand that a defendant, a person charged with a crime, gets a fair trial. Uh, and so I get to balance all of those interests in do good for the community. So that's sort of what's driven me. And I eventually put, subjected myself to being to running in an election and becoming the state's attorney. And finally, my Usually it's a little bit more like this, but yes. Thank you for serving. My pleasure. Shannon, good morning, everyone. Let me first off tell you what I'm not. I'm not a speaker, I'm not a coach, I'm not an author, I'm just a caring woman in the community who loves African American history and culture. Um, since 2012 till 2015, I served as um, a commissioner in Maryland for the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, <coughs> which of course is appointed by the governor's office. And I am so excited that Larry has invited me here to be at this dinner today because if you look behind you, there is a statewide Maryland report. And I was one of the commissioners who were very, very instrumental in capturing my hometown, um, Cairo County, history in this quote. And that's historic for us in Cairo County. If you know anything about Cairo County, that's extra historic. And I also was able to capture a home that my parents had, which we were the first ones in Cairo County with electricity. So that was the Parker family in Cali County. 
Currently, I also serve as the president for an organization called ROSA. And ROSA means remembering our ancestors' synergistic association. One of the reasons why I love Larry is because he knows how to bring the right people together. If you know anything about history, if you know anything about your ancestors, it's about connecting, it's about synergy, it's about working for your community to add value. So, if you want to know about Sharon, Sharon is passionate about herself. She's passionate about her young generation and she wants to inspire them to follow in our ancestors' footsteps. And thank you for mentioning uh, the fact that Larry knows how to bring yeah. uh, the right people together, the variety, the diversity of people. And we are here to celebrate our businesses and our accomplishments and to help others to be inspired by that. And we are doing that in the way of voting for Larry as our community, our, our best community um, partner and the Steve Harvey neighborhood awards and we want you and when you're during your breaks to text someone and tell them how easy it is to vote so that we can get right, so on that. We just got off the air. I did not make the top four. It's not over yet. Last year I didn't get to one to a pop. Big man that has won this thing two years in a row Stan Richards his name has not been mentioned which is a good sign. Yes. Those that have uh, been in the top four throughout the day so let's keep praying. Yeah. Yes, and keep voting. Yeah. Two thousand dollars for Bates Legacy Center. We yeah. need to get you in there, Rosa, and our share. So let's keep on going. Yeah. Yes. And I appreciate it. Yes, right. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, the fact that we've all come together, and we've seen this across uh, the Facebook pages to continue to inspire one another. So, Larry, would you share with us a little bit about? Sure, not a problem. My name is Lyric Hawkins, and I have created the Rockstar 360 movement. And the Rockstar 360 is very, you know, it just means so much to me because what we do is try to assist women, usually 35 to 65, to shift the mind. The 360 represents the shifting of the mindset. The Rockstar represents what we are and what we can be in business. Because sometimes when we get to a certain age or a certain place in life, we have circumstances and situations that kind of just leave space in our mind and tell us that we can't. We're over 35 or we're a single parent, we just had a divorce or, you know, my favorite thing, the thing that I went through the most was I did that already. It didn't work. I tried that business. As a matter of fact, I tried it five times and it didn't work. And what we do is take that energy, negative energy, and we also take negative energy from family, our good, good girlfriends, and we accept that as truth. So I started a movement to let women know that we can do whatever we want to do. We can be rock stars in whatever business we choose to be rock stars in. It's all a mindset. Because some of those things that we allow to be space in our mind are temporary. We let them stay there. So we, if we just decide to do a 360 degree mind shift, then we can become rock stars in whatever business we want to be. Life does not end at 35. Life does not end because you have um, three children and you're a single parent. It just does not end. But it's all created with the mindset. So we created this program, Rockstar 360, just to show women that they can. And we're currently working on a Rockstar 360 Junior, which helps assist middle school students and high school students who are interested in becoming future entrepreneurs. So I just took situations um, that I have went through and said, hey, I'm not the only one that felt like that. So now we just show women how to restart, revamp, and reinvent themselves to become the rock star that they are. I really appreciate that you uh, have a passion for women and just want you to know that it's not over when you're 60. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. That's true. That's true. That's true. Great. Would you share with us your passions and how you are doing what you're doing with uh, BWI? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am 
Frank Lawrence, I'm a deputy fire chief at the BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport. I've been a public servant over 40 years, retired United States Marine, Rock, and have uh, continued my service uh, when I returned to Merle uh, as a public servant uh, safety and working in the fire service. I'm an avid for diversity. I believe in that uh, our public deserve the public service that look like the community. So I'm always recruiting for minority dealing with public service. And I must say to the ladies to my right, I need more females. I must say that if you could help me in that matter, that would be greatly appreciated. It's a great profession of public service, especially for our emergency service, and we need women in that service. The job is not that hard. It's very easy, it's technical, it's not that hard. So I encourage you to send women to my area of expertise. I think we greatly appreciate it. And for anyone in the audience, we will really challenge you if you have sons and daughters, cousins, Please send them and look at this. It. It's a million dollar industry. In your career, you can earn over a million dollars as a firefighter or an emergency provider. And great work schedules. Great work schedules. Thank you. Thank you. And so we will all connect with you and maybe share with you some places where you might talk to some young people. I immediately am thinking about some of our college students who have not yet our community college, we have not yet decided. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the need for women and that the work is not as strenuous or hard as some people may imagine it to be, I think that might be one of the deterrents for women. So I certainly appreciate understanding that it can be uh, really many more opportunities than just the, the kind of work that we have traditionally imagined. Thank you. Thank you. So, Wendy. Uh, I'm Wendy Winters. Uh, I'm not the only one in this county. You're but not the only one in this county. No, no. Uh, we've been introduced as twins. So. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, she made a her a little older. Dr. Wendy Winters was a demon and is now retired. And her husband was surprised to find out he was married to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's one of the few uh, African Americans with sail, sailing buffs. Yeah, there. he's a sailing buff. But um, I am, uh, I was a freelancer for many years with the Capitol, and now I've been on staff for two years. I write three weekly columns, most people write one. Plus I do a lot of the other community um, news inserts like retirement living, from the garden, all sorts of things. Um, I have to run a 5K this Saturday when I want to or not. I photograph myself while I'm doing it. That'll be fun. Selfie stick. Get excited. I like the, the it, it's kind of hard to explain, but um, I've had careers in journalism and in public relations, and I'm also a photographer. And I've never had a course in public relations or journalism or photography or writing. I just learned by doing. Um, I had my own PR agency in New York. Uh, but the specialty was fashion. I worked with top designers, uh, either with my own agency or others that I worked for. I worked for Oscar de la Renta, Albert Hahn, uh, Donna Karen when she was nice, uh, and, and dealt with tons of other designers, produced fashion shows and things like that. Uh, when we moved down here with four kids, sorry, there's not a lot of fashion here. Uh, um, I had to switch gears and started writing for a variety of publications in this area. And um, eventually the Capitol and I kind of glommed on to each other. Uh, one, of, I, one of my favorite columns is Tina the Week. Uh, the person who started it stopped because she said she'd never win an award writing. She's right. But I do get to uh, lightly grill a teenager every week. And they have covered the spectrum. Uh, they started Team of the Week years ago because usually you only saw a teenager on the sports pages or doing the perp walk. And uh, so this is a way to celebrate teens and there's like no GPA requirements, no varsity letter requirement. They don't have to be on the way to Harvard, they just have to have someone who cares enough to nominate them. Uh, but the downside is as the cons got more popular, I now have candidates back up into October. I also write Home of the Week. 
<laughs> and I have to find 50 homes every year. Now, a home for me has been the back of someone's Plymouth Voyager. It was my way of showing, as I said, how we treat our Olympic athletes. One of our Olympic athletes lived in a car, uh, as opposed to the Polish athletes who lived in top hotels in the Mediterranean. Uh, our gal, Farah Hall, brought that kind grad had to travel around and live in her car. And it went to Europe with her for the uh, 2012 Olympics. Um, I have done the Lighthouse Shelter to show people what it looked like in the family. I've done the Lighthouse at Thomas Point because I wanted to see it. Um, I've done Willow House, which is a women's shelter. And I've done, um, I was telling her, a really grungy, Boys' dorm room, St. John's. They knew we were coming, and you think they, you think you guys would pick up your dirty underpants and you have this. But no. Uh, and then on the other hand, we did a dorm room at Bangkok Hall where the poor guys were boiled in bleach all night before we got there. Um, so we do all kinds. And yes, we do the Oh My God houses, the ones where they would never invite me in unless I was doing the story. Um, so I cover the spectrum. Um, I like to illuminate lives, and occasionally I have hopefully save lives talking about cancer, breast cancer, diseases, things like that. Uh, but that's what the capital is. It's a community paper. Uh, you're not going to see that with the Sun, the Post, or even the New York Times. Uh, but if you want your hometown scores, what's happening in your hometown, open the paper or dial it up. That's where they are. And now we're there 24-7. Well, thank you for bringing a little glass to the capital. Yeah, I appreciate it. Fashion, the New York style, the, the variety of, um, of adventures that you have that you would seek out something other than the ordinary is certainly appreciated. And now we know a little bit more about Whitney Winters. Yeah. Well, now they're trying to get me to do a zip line in my bathroom. <laughs> well, and I can almost guarantee you that any of these guys would not be the ones who had their underwear still. <laughs> <laughs>
is judged uh, and criticized, whether it's right or wrong, uh, you're always going to have someone who looks at you and, and may not agree with you. And that's okay. And I think one of the things I've tried to pride myself on doing is at least explaining how I got into a decision and showing people this is the data or information that I saw that, that motivated me to, to vote a particular way. Um, but, but ultimately, regardless of all the, the hate mails one may receive, or even, even good mail, we get, we get uh, whenever we vote, particularly way, there are those who are supportive of those decisions as well. Uh, so that's always a, a positive when you see those remarks. Uh, but I'm just one to do this, is try to help and, and, and sort of uh, uh, inspire the next generation who's going to come after me. Uh, I've always said, you know, my mom was, was 19 years old, had five kids, and it was completely tough growing up in the community that I grew up in. So not having men to inspire me, uh, at least the right type of men. And that affected my brothers and my sisters. Uh, but I had a police officer who, who actually took me under his wing uh, when I was two years old. And so he helped tell your brother's story. We'll tell, tell your story. We, we only have an hour. Right? <laughs> 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 you know, you to you talk about him in jail or about how the two of you kind of say oh, yes. Same upbringing, same, same places. Oh, there's a book. There's a book. Yeah, there's a book. Oh, there's a book. But it's interesting because, like he mentioned, we uh, we were only two years apart, but uh, we grew up. In fact, we shared the same bed. We had bunk beds at one point, and then uh, uh, once I got older, we split the bunk beds in. And he took his hat from home, and I took this hat. Um, but we grew up in the same environment. Now both of us we took these completely different paths, journeys in life. And it's it's amazing. Maybe there's a book. That's a book. That's a book. Why he not me? Oh man, I think I just came over the title. So that's that's what motivated me, just to make a difference. Well, thank you for serving, and thank you for serving. Yeah, we have been serving for things uh, most of their adult life, and we certainly not only appreciate what you've given in the past, but all that you do right now. And if you are in very, very uh, I've been in that place where so you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, but as long as you stay the course of your values and honorable and transparent the way you just described, you can only be successful. Yeah? So, Lieutenant Eddie J. Smith, please share with us. You're not the last because we're actually in a semi circle. So. <laughs> Alright, I'm, I'm T.J. Smith, um, I'm a lieutenant with the police department, I've been here for 16 years, I'm currently the director of communications, and um, I'm born and raised in Baltimore, so a lot of what's gone on in the last uh, month or so is near and dear to my heart, my um, grandmother still lives there, and I also grew up in it, so to see some of this stuff was troubling, but um, the reason I chose to put this uniform on in the first place, uh, back in 1999, um, to be the antithesis of what we're seeing now. And um, there are issues in the country, and there are things that uh, we as uh, police officers should represent, and uh, obviously saw some of those things growing up, good and bad. But um, I'm a proud uh, product of Baltimore City Public Schools, and I'll never forget my fourth grade teacher saw me uh, a number of years ago and said, I always thought you'd be on the other side of the law. <laughs> as they were look at me now. <laughs> I uh, came to Santa Monica County by happenstance, just ended up here and worked in West County most of my career with the Pioneer City Meet Village community and saw a lot of young uh, black males that were in upbringing similar to mine and my friends. And, um, you know, I felt like I had defied the odds, so we developed some mentoring programs to help uh, some young people out. Uh, one of the signatures we taught them how to tie neckties. Um, we look at that as a symbol of being a man. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many men don't know how to do some of the basics. So we try to peel back the players that are in and teach them, you know, we tell them go get a job, but we never prepared them how to go get a job. So how to fill out a job application, how to dress for success, and how to speak. So uh, that's, uh, you know, some of my driving motivation behind uh, wearing a uniform in this tough time. Uh, but it, it, I'm okay with it because uh, at the same time that, uh, we're trying to uh, do things differently from a community perspective and, and bring this full circle. That's my job, that's our job as law enforcement. We should be out there. Um, uh, uh, just get excited here. Uh, and, and they, were, they were surprised I took a picture with them yeah. because they're so used to at least being standoff. 
and I'm, I'm like, well, that's what we're supposed to do. You know, I mean, I'm going to speak at my son's school in another month, and they're, uh, you know, young kids, you know, three, four, five, and that's the most nervous group that I'm going to have. <laughs> but that's what we're supposed to do, and I'm going to do it one step at a time, one day at a time, and get back to that. Yes. Yes. They go out and do the good things every single day. Um, and it's unfortunate that sort of nationally we're seeing only the bad things. Uh, but there are, I mean, every day the reason why we're safe is because the firefighters and police officers go out and do their jobs. And it's like being an NFL line. It's unheralded, it's unspoken about. They're only talked about when they commit holding them, which is, which is rare, but it shapes the national perception who these guys really are, that's what I'm saying. I appreciate that, and um, uh, TJ, we certainly appreciate your service, again, yeah. in the past and the current, and as you just expressed, the future. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right, the, the, the audience that, that gives me the most chills are the youngest people because they're so impressionable. Mm -hmm. And they just hang on to your every word, and probably for you, they hang on to your needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we really appreciate that you're in our county, that you've chosen to straddle Baltimore here, because I'm sure that uh, Ferguson and Baltimore City's happenings have uh, helped to inform how you plan to continue to do your work. So thank you very much. Before I ask the audience to, to, uh, to see if you have any questions, I know I'm excited about listening to the variety of experiences that we have here. Um, Larry, did you have something that you'd like to share? TJ, the only reason why you're not afraid of you <laughs> She's saying you didn't either. I'd like to have just to, uh, if you can, before you leave, because I know you have some very busy schedules. Uh, that lunch in the show was a couple weeks ago, and you had to do that emergency press conference, uh, Wes. I appreciate you taking the time. But you take the time before you leave to patronize the vendors here. There's a lot of things that they do, and, and I've got to tell you, these folks have been with me for a long time. They, they, some of them have driven from Charles County, Prince George's County, and uh, we're glad to have you, Wes, that you came out of Prince George's County with Glenn Ivy and uh, Ed also Brooks to be here and do a great job that you, you know you're going to continue doing while you're in, in office. And Pete, thank you. So just wanted to plug the, the vendors. And everybody, just stay as long as you want. We do have another panel coming in at 2 o'clock, so vendors, do not feel that we have to count on All right. So I, I thought as I was um, just energized by some of the things you all had to say, and, and Wes, you actually started what I was hoping to do, and that's to have the panel members respond to anything that you heard from other panel members, either a comment or a question that you might have of each other. Well, you know, I think, I think it's encouraging um, that you talked about being a single mom with three kids. Three. I'm not a single mom with three kids. I have one. <laughs> you didn't have to tell me twice. Because that, 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 that is, and, and I want to sort of uh, uh, just give kudos to all the, the mothers out there, yeah. especially the single mothers, because I think part of the reason you have Baltimore type issues is because the men have not been there. And I, I'll, 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 I'm, saying, I'm just calling it like it is. I think we need to do more uh, uh, in those communities because the moms have literally been there holding up the fort, holding down the homes, uh, and there are things policy-wise we can do to affect that, certainly, uh, but I want to give credit to all the women who have just been like the linchpin in our communities that have kept people like me uh, off the street and motivated and, and fed and, uh, and cared for, and so I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a single mom, so uh, yeah, thank you for tough, listening. It's a tough job being a single parent, and I've always seemed like I was hustling, hustling, and hustling, even though I only had one child. Sometimes you're a single parent with help. You got grandma and aunties, and I was a single, single parent. So I didn't have any options. So when I made the decision, hey, I'm going to go to Howard University, and I'm 40 years old, you know, uh-oh, I got to be down Georgia Avenue at 7 in the morning. Her school doesn't even open up till 7 in the morning. You know, you have to make those decisions. I said, OK, well, you got to go with me today. You know, so. I've always been helping try to provide a better life because I knew it was just me and her. You know, 
that I always told her growing up. It's just you and I. Make sure that I know what's going on in your world so I can take care of you and protect you because we have each other. So I try to set the example that you can be whatever you want to be. Circumstances, that's just, that's just what they are. They're not permanent situations. So it's what you think and how you feel. It's the 360 shift on the mindset. So you feel like you're stuck, then you're stuck. If you feel like you're not, then you're not. Either way, you're right. Uh, that's so true. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, and I can attest to that because I grew up and my mom was a single parent. My father um, was murdered uh, when I was seven years old, so it was me and my sister. And we, you know, she didn't have a car. My in-laws, uh, her in-laws didn't help her. So I know the struggle. I lived it. But I tell you, we lived in one bedroom. We were all three so big. But my mother, she is my hero, and I dedicated this book to her. Yeah, because because she did not give up. She went to work every single. They didn't get on with it. Not, not, not saying nothing wrong with it. But she had so much pride that we would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. She'd take the two girls. We lived in D.C. We grew up in the hood. You know. So I am a product. So I am here to say that it doesn't matter what your circumstances It doesn't matter. Um, so my hat's off to the single mom. So my mother was one. She did a phenomenal job. And you know, the funny thing is, my mother, three of us, she was a single mother. She worked for NASA. So, by her working for NASA, we just, you know, we're, we're kind of all right with a good government job. She came home one day, quit her good government job with three kids, worked at the local Popeyes, and we was like, oh. but she went to law school. We was all like, you know, at the time, you're a kid, you're like, you're what? You know, you quit your job to go to law school, you had three kids. And so which made it really tough on us. But as I look back, and she had became a magistrate, in, in the state of Virginia, it was like, oh, that's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's so the struggle is real, but yeah. you know, how bad do you want it? Exactly. That's right. Stand. Yeah, Stand up so we can hear. And I guess the first one, I guess, is growing up myself in a single parent home and having my mother and mother some amazing miracles. And you guys here were kind of talking about some of the miracles. Had to work as a single parent. And I want this question to for the man here. Uh, how important as a parent is it to believe in those miracles? And how important is it to have young children to be able to work? It's a must in my household. Yeah. It's a must. I remember one day my daughter did something. She said something. I said, That's just an excuse. She said, Oh, no, I don't do excuses. I know who my mother is. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, excuses aren't allowed. Either you did it, and these are the consequences. There's no, well, I did it because, because there's no justification for that. You know right from wrong. So we don't do excuses. That's right. So, the, 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 I have a buddy of mine. Again, I'm, I'm very proud of a number of my friends who, again, we need to $5 dollars coming from the same time and five we don't want to continue that trend. He started a Stop Fatherless movement, which, you know, trying to get the parents who have disconnected with their children, reconnected with their kids, because it, it's, a, it's a great story. I'm unbelievably proud of my mother, but there are things as men that we don't learn that we need to learn from a male. And the woman, by nature, is a nurturer. So therefore, we're going to get away as young men with certain things that we're not going to even try to pull on dad or on the father figure. So it is important to reconnect these family structures as much of a badge of honor as women can wear for the, the, the unbelievable job that they do. Uh, because uh, quite frankly, women do it at a rate that's unbelievable to men. But we, yeah, I'm not going to with my wife and she works harder with my child doing things than I do. I mean, it's not naturally, it's just a natural nurturing thing. But, but again, that doesn't make the structure right. And we can't continue to perpetuate it. We have to realize when we enter into the bedroom, we're entering into a business contract. Yeah. And we can't allow that contract to collapse if the offspring is produced as a result. 